Well, good morning, Winters. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Before we get started, you can stand on your feet, but I wanted to bring your attention to something. Um, in your bulletin, there is a nominating slip to be put into the offering plate. That is nominating for elders and trustees. That, wasn't, that was put on there on purpose, on purpose. Don't throw that away. We want you to be thinking about who to nominate. Mike will have more about that uh, later in the announcement. Is that all right? Now, really stand to your feet as we sing our first hymn, Jesus paid it all, all to him, to him I owe. Together. I hear the Savior say, thy strength. Day, hoping to encounter Christ. We come with the burdens that need to be lifted and questions answered. We come looking for help. Where will help come from? Our help comes from the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. May our hearts be open to the Lord. Let our hearts rejoice in God's kindness and love. May our hearts be healed, strengthened for service. Come, let us worship God together. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. The Hebrew reading today comes from Joel chapter 2, verses 1 to 2 and 12 through 17. Blow the trumpet in Zion and sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness spread upon the mountains, 
a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts, but, and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from punishment. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, consecrate the congregation, Assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where, the, where is their God? Today's gospel reading comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Loving and gracious God, you do see all things. You are with us at all times, and we are so grateful to have you. God, be with us today as we pray and we sing and we gather together. Lord, be with us as we join together for lunch and share fellowship and communion in your name, Lord. Thank you for always being part of our lives and guiding us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 Bethlehem and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will Verses 1 through 7. Second Corinthians, verses chapter 5, 1 through 7. And it says, let's go together. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be further clothed with our heavenly dwelling. For surely when we have been clothed in it, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan under our burden because we wish not to be unclothed, but to be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. The one who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as down payment. So we are always confident even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Gracious God, you have to help us now in this preaching moment. Speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. using as a thought this morning, walk, walking by faith and not by sight. Now, I'm going to just tell you, I'm going to go a little slower this morning so y'all can keep up, right? You all right? A little slower, I'm going to need you to think through it um, with me, because we come to this moment just not to be preached to, but we come to think. Is that all right? We come to think. Now, I'm still going to need my amen corner. You all know who you are. So let me start here. It is Lent, so we're beginning our journey to the cross. Is that right? However, I'm making a right of delight this week and jumping to the resurrection to confirm the thesis of this week's message. We are continuing our conversation around faith. Conversation around faith. We've already, it, because if we're really going to understand the power of the cross in 2024, this Lenten season, then we have to grab hold tightly of this thing called faith. The Hebrew writer said that faith is made up of the things we hope for, but whose evidence we don't see or really perceive. As a point of reference, we considered Peter and his walk out on the water last week, concluding we serve of the God of the impossible. There is nothing that God cannot do. Let me repeat that. There is nothing God cannot do. Now, I don't know about you, but I can say with confidence that my faith in God through Jesus Christ has provided me a way of escape, comfort, 
peace and joy when I found myself in a jam, in a tight squeeze, up against the wall, corner between a rock and a hard place, worried, depressed, despondent, and distressed. Verse 7 of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Now that sounds nice, but the why and the how does any of that work in reality? Verses 1 through 6 tries to frame it for us. Paul is trying to encourage the Corinthian church. He is essentially saying, even if our body is destroyed in the earth, if it decays, doesn't work properly, or for the sake of the gospel, you lay it down, don't worry, because we have a home that is internal in the heavens. Now, to fully grasp and believe what Paul is espousing, it will require faith because you can't see heaven. You have to believe that there is a place prepared for us after this life. Let me see if I can continue to frame it up. Y'all still with me? Yeah. Without a doubt, belief is a personal thing. No one, Wences, can tell you what to believe. I'm going to say it again. No one can tell you what to believe. Not even God, and God intended it that way. We are free to believe whatever we want. The only thing you and I can't control are the consequences of that belief or unbelief. We can believe and accept that nothing can be done about the unmitigated gun violence except that regular mass shootings in this country cannot be curbed. It's a normal and acceptable risk we just have to come to terms with that we can be gunned down attending a parade, school, church, or just showing up at work. We can believe lies and watch climate change progress undeterred. We can believe January 6th was a peaceful protest that just got out of hand. We can believe black people exaggerate when conveying experience with modern day racism and policing. We can believe that all the black folks in urban centers cast fraudulent ballots in places like Detroit, Philly, and Atlanta in 2020 causing the states to flip. Now let me just pause right there. I've been black my whole life. <laughs> Seriously, I've been black my entire life. We ain't that organized. <laughs> I'm telling you, we're we, we not that organized. My point is this, Wentz, is what you and I believe is entirely up to us. That's the way it's been since the beginning of time. The Bible records that Nimrod believed he could build a tower into the heavens. Esau believed he didn't have his didn't need his birthright. The silly Philistine giant believed he could take out the boy shepherd David. Pharaoh, Pharaoh believed he could enslave all the Jews without consequences. Absalom believed he would be a better king than his father David. Jezebel believed she could kill Elijah. Samson believed he could trust Delilah. The Pharisees believed they could discredit Jesus and Pilate believed he could kill Jesus. Listen to me very carefully. Here's what I'm trying to get you to see. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ who got up out of the grave with all power in the earth, under the earth, and in the heavens. You are walking by faith because there's no historical count of Christ's resurrection. Amen. Now, I got a few amens, but there's some of y'all's backsides puckering <laughs> because that goes against everything we've been taught from Sunday school on. I know a couple of you instantly thought, isn't that the Bible? Isn't that a historical account? Now, before you pucker too tight and cut off the circulation to your feet, <laughs> allow me to explain. A historical record is a written account created to preserve administrative, legal, operational, fiscal, and historical content. Its goal is to provide insight into the past. It allows us to understand what shapes our world, whether it's ancient manuscripts, official documents, or personal diaries. A historical record is a valuable resource for the unraveling of the tapestry of our human history. Follow me now. Historical records often reflect the bias and perspective of the writer. Sometimes they write with incomplete information. Sometimes they make mistakes or errors. Sometimes they write from memory or oral tradition with no facts to review. Sometimes their writing becomes worn or damaged and historians who try to restore it may end up with differing interpretation. And even worse, sometimes historical records can be intentionally and alter, altered or falsified. Still, getting still, these records are essential for understanding the past. They provide glimpses into the long past eras, shed light on cultural norms, and reveal the complexities of our social and human experiences. Am I going too deep for y'all this morning? Y'all all right? 
However, the scriptures are not just a historical account of creation or the journey of God's chosen people or the advent or the birth of Jesus Christ. It also is a book written by folks who were divinely inspired by God to record divine instruction that give insight that allows our hearts to be comforted, contented, and spirits to find rest, peace, and joy. The scriptures are an article of faith. If you and I don't approach the scriptures with an attitude of faith, that is certainly our choice. In that case, the scriptures will remain just another ancient book on the shelf or a nightstand collecting dust for you and I until we accept it was divinely inspired. It's all a matter of faith. Unless God stirs our faith, we will believe Jesus was just a good dude who got caught up in some mess. What are you driving at, Rev? There is no human corroborating historical record of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was God who moved the hands of the eyewitnesses like Peter and John to record what God would have us to know concerning the resurrection. It's a powerful, miraculous event that was attested to by hundreds of eyewitnesses. But the record of that historical occasion is passed down to us only from the hand of God. No historian of antiquity ever mentioned the resurrection in their writings. Here comes the proof. The historian Tacitus wrote that Pilate crucified Christ, but he made no mention of the resurrection. The historian Josephus wrote that Jesus was executed at the request of Pilate, but he also made no mention of the resurrection. The historian Alexander de Mint wrote in his papers that execution of Jesus was probably not seen as a particularly important event by the Romans because many other people were crucified at the time and forgotten. What is missing in these three historical accounts is a record of the resurrection. No mention was made by these noted historians that Jesus rose from the dead. Am I talking right here? But early church father, I usually don't go to the early church fathers, but this one struck me. Ignatius of Antioch, in his epistles to the Terillians and Sumerians, wrote about the birth, passing, crucifixion, and resurrection of Christ. Neither he, nor Tacitus, nor Josephus witnessed the resurrection. So the question becomes, why did Ignatius write what the other two did not? Ignatius was influenced by faith and not by sight. Ignatius could stress the resurrection in his epistles as a historical fact because he and others already read the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, eyewitnesses to this miraculous event, and he may have actually met a few witnesses to that empty tomb who gave him an aging verbal account of what they saw with their own eyes. But, seeing, but if seeing is believing, Ignatius was not so much a historian as he was a believer. The only people who wrote the account of the resurrection were those who were inspired by God to record the history. If it was God who inspired these disciples to put pen in hand and let the spirit lead them as they wrote. Still, Doug and Rick, there's this nagging question of why didn't historians write about such a supernatural event? Even if they weren't followers of Christ, they should have been compelled to write something about an empty tomb. If you heard something about somebody got out of the grave, surely you would write that down. They could have easily been many reasons. Maybe they were fearful. Maybe there were too many oral inconsistencies. Maybe they surely just didn't give a right. Mm. I believe, though, that God would never leave such an important miracle left to be recorded by chance. The resurrection was recorded by the moving of God's spirit so that every person, man, woman, and child would have to believe by faith. Some of the New Testament writers were witnesses, but they still had to believe by faith. Even the disciples doubted in the days following the resurrection. Until Jesus appeared to them several times in the upper room, the garden, and on the road to Emmaus and the ascension. Hear me, when says, all the great works of God were always accomplished by faith and not by sight. By faith, Abraham took Isaac up on Mount Moriah. By faith, Moses stretched out the rod in his hand. By faith, the emancipated Hebrew slave passed through the parted waters of the Red Sea. By faith, the Israelites marched around the walls of Jericho. By faith, Deborah rode into battle with a fearful Barak. 
And by faith, Jesus willingly offered himself a living sacrifice. The chief priests mocked Jesus on the cross. Matthew and Luke recount them saying, if you are really the king of the Jews, really Israel, come down off the cross and we will believe you. Mark wrote about the moment of Jesus' trial before Pilate. The chief priest accused him of saying many things, but he answered nothing. If in that moment Jesus had justified himself, we would not be justified by faith. Now, in keeping with my seminary training, because I still have outstanding student loans, <laughs> here are three quick points for you to ponder. First, the resurrection validates Christ's claim to be the Son of God. Second, the resurrection demonstrates God's power over death in the grave and provides hope for eternal life. Third, the resurrection provides that Jesus Christ is the powerful Son of God who has all powers on, all in his hand. Hold death where is your sting, grave where is your victory. And that's it. I'm really almost done. There was, nothing, there was no other point to this message other than to affirm our belief that God declared Christ his only begotten son as our deliverer to believe by faith. If you're waiting for some proof to be excavated from the Middle East or some ancient historical account to surface, I'm sorry to tell you, you'll be waiting for a long time. In the meantime, this is what I'm getting to, the only way for us to work on the things that have been trusted to our hands, winces, is by faith and not by sight. The only way we'll build and expand Winces community is by faith and not by sight. All the resources we need to accomplish everything that we are destined to do will come by faith and not by sight. Are y'all with me? If you are here at 3246 or watching by YouTube or following us on some other social media platform, I challenge you, I implore you by faith to believe God can heal your body. By faith, believe God can work a miracle in that loved one. Stand believing and expecting God will see you through that situation that still is unresolved. By faith, God will give you peace from your weary thoughts, a restful night's sleep, bring your kids back home, dry up your anxiety and depression. If by faith we believe that Christ is the solution to our problems, by faith we believe that Christ can satisfy our hunger, by faith we believe that Christ is the comfort for all the world's misery, by faith we believe that Christ is the healer for sickness that seems to be running rampant. And I don't know about you, Winters, but faith, I believe that Christ has forgiven you and I, cleansed us from all unrighteousness. By faith, I believe that Christ has the power to heal our damaged emotions, unresolved trauma, and supply courage for our weakened hearts. By faith, I believe that Christ's spirit will help us grow in faith, love, and patience. By faith, I believe that Christ can give you a purpose. By faith, I believe that Christ can change anything, can change any situation. Now. You, if you don't believe any of that of what I just said or just some of it, that's your choice. I offer no judgment. As for the rest of us, we'll keep walking by faith and not by sight. God bless you Amen. this morning. Amen.